A long-lost lamb is in the fold, a woman's coin retrieved. A wayward son is home again, most lovingly received. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer and our good shepherd. Amen. Please be seated. Welcome home. And welcome back to choir. Thank you, choir, for being here. This is our first homecoming Sunday since 2019. It's good to see some that I haven't seen for a while. Yes. Thanks be to God. It's good to have three-dimensional bodies in here. And I believe we have not been able to fix our camera. The one Sunday, Thomas is gone. Our cameras don't work. But I think the audio is coming through. But I think that's all the more reason to invite people to come back in person. I'm glad you are here in person. Today's gospel reading is from Luke chapter 15, which includes the most beloved parables about coming home, homecoming. The parable of the lost sheep returning home to its fold and the parable of the lost coin returning to its owner are both a preamble. They both serve as a preamble to the parable of the prodigal son returning home to his father who welcomes him with open arms and then throws a party and a barbecue, which is what we're going to have later today. Hope you can join us. We're not going to kill the fattened calf, but we will have burgers and hot dogs outside, so please stick around. Today's parables feature a shepherd and a woman, and these are two key figures, key archetypes in our Anglican and Christian tradition. Some of the earliest portrayals of Jesus that predate images of the cross, some of the earliest portrayals of Jesus are representations of Christ as the good shepherd, carrying the lamb on his shoulder. And the only time, yes, thank you, you're getting ahead of me, yes, it is portrayed right here as a dominant image for us because it is the central image stained glass window designed by John Mallon. Thank you. I asked the eight o'clockers, why is it such a dominant image for us? And they didn't notice that. So thank you, Helen. It's key to who we are as Christ Church Ricans. And the image goes all the way back to the founding of the Ecclesia Anglicana, the Anglican Church. So back in the sixth century, when Pope Gregory the Great sent his Benedictine buddy, Augustine, not Augustine of Hippo, but Augustine of Canterbury, to the land of the the pagan Angles to found the Church of England. The missionary monk arrived really carrying two main sacred objects. He carried a cross and an image of Christ as the shepherd with the lamb on his shoulder, just like you can see in your bulletin on page 11 and on page 13, and of course, our central window. One of my predecessors used to ask the children, how many sheep can they spot in that window? I asked this before. I asked this, I think I'm, yeah, I asked, think I asked it, um, yeah, maybe Good Shepherd Sunday, so the fourth Sunday of Easter. So eight o'clockers can't answer, but how many sheep do you see up there? You get a free hamburger if you can get it right. (laughs) Five, really good guess. Four. Do I hear higher? Six. You've got to look very carefully. There are six sheep in that beautiful window designed by John Mallon, who also designed the windows at... Carson Mansion and several other churches throughout California. But that's the image that was brought to the angles. 
1,500 years ago. And St. Augustine chose to set up his home base in Kent in southeast England, Canterbury, because there was a woman there, a queen, who had already committed herself, committed her life to Christ, the Good Shepherd. That was Queen Bertha. And she was instrumental in convincing her husband, King Ethelbert, the king of the Angles, to welcome and accommodate and support Augustine in his mission. A shepherd and a woman. Key characters in today's gospel parables were central figures in the founding of our Anglican heritage. And strong and powerful and wise women have consistently played key roles in our church's growth and evolution over the years, over the decades. Mother Hilda, the abbess of Whitby, helped reconcile and integrate the the Celtic and Roman Christian traditions at the Synod of Whitby in the 7th century. Dame Julian of Norwich, the anchoress, offered theological reflections on her visions, her near-death experience in the 14th century. And those reflections continue to challenge and inspire and comfort people today as they comforted me when I first read them 21 years ago exactly when I was a student at Westmont College when I was comforted by her words along with the entire classroom when she said all shall be well and all shall be well and all manner of things shall be well God holds us lovingly in the palm of his hand we needed to hear that on September 11th and then a contemporary of Julian the boisterous, powerful, charismatic, and slightly, uh, to some, annoying uh, Marjorie Kemp, a medieval pilgrim, wrote the first autobiography, first spiritual autobiography, and first autobiography in general in the English language. And those words still challenge us today. And of course, Queen Elizabeth I, who brought reconciliation to a deeply divided church and nation after decades of bloody religious conflict. And she's honored today as the true founder of modern Anglicanism, not her father who kind of bumbled and stumbled into reforming the church. She was intentional about founding something new. All these women understood and sought to embody the meaning of today's parables, which are all about repentance. Repentance. And I preach about this a lot during Lent. When we read the parable of the prodigal son, which follows after these two, what is repentance? When they said, repent, repent, I wondered what they meant. To quote Leonard Cohen. The Hebrew word for repent is shuv, shuv, a monosyllabic word, which means simply to turn, to turn. To repent is to turn towards the one who is always seeking to bring us home. To turn to the one who is always seeking to bring us back home. And this turning often involves turning away from a path that is unhealthy, sinful or stupid and foolish to use Jeremiah's words and this turning often involves saying I'm sorry I'm sorry to those we may have hurt or offended and this is important because there seems to be a misunderstanding among some Christians today that apologizing is a sign of weakness unless you're Jesus I can't Imagine any authentic Christian going through life without saying, I'm sorry. Because that is so often essential, if not always essential, to true repentance. That is why we say in our confession almost every Sunday, we are truly sorry. And we humbly repent. We repent 
of our failure to love God and to love others and to love ourselves. Sometimes we need to apologize to ourselves for failing to love ourselves. The shepherd and the woman in today's parables and the women who have shepherded our church throughout history invite us to repent, to turn to the one who is always seeking to bring us home. This last week, we lost a strong and powerful and wise woman who shepherded her country and her church and in many ways the entire global community with humility and dignity and compassion and grace. We grieve the loss of Queen Elizabeth II. We pray she rest in peace and rise in glory. The queen who devoted her entire life to service was a spiritual descendant, if not a, a royal descendant, of Queen Bertha, who welcomed St. Augustine of Canterbury and his image of Christ the Good Shepherd. 1,500 years ago, she connected us to that history. And Bertha, Queen Bertha was a saint, is a saint. And like St. Bertha, Queen Elizabeth II, Queen Elizabeth II understood the meaning of today's parables. The queen was not blind to the fact that although we have so much to celebrate when it comes to Great Britain and the largest empire in human history, the British Empire, the empire was not always perfect. I don't need to go into details, you know. We talked about some of that during the last several weeks in learning about the Anglican provinces of our communion. She understood that. And in her 2011 Christmas address, which was a decade after 9-11, the 10th anniversary, she said these words, Although we are capable of great acts of kindness, and she certainly was not only capable, but she demonstrated those acts of kindness. Although we are capable of great acts of kindness, history teaches us that we sometimes need saving from ourselves, from our recklessness and our greed. God sent into the world a unique person, neither a philosopher or a general, though important as they are, but a savior, a shepherd with the power to forgive. Forgiveness, she says, lies at the heart of the Christian faith. And just in case I was thinking maybe I should preach a different sermon this morning, I got an email from Richard Rohr this morning who's said, in the first sentence, when all is said and done, the gospel really comes down to forgiveness. Forgiveness lies at the heart of the Christian faith. It can heal broken families, it can restore friendships, and it can reconcile divided communities. It is in forgiveness that we feel the power of God's love. So on this Welcome Home Sunday, may we honor the legacy of these powerful women who have shepherded the church, especially Queen Elizabeth II. May we honor their legacy by devoting our lives to service, by refusing to turn a blind eye to our own sin, to our own complicity in sinful and unjust structures, and by repenting, by turning to the shepherd who is always seeking to forgive us and carry us back home. It is in that place of forgiveness, according to her majesty, that we will feel the power of 
God's love. Let everyone who suffers now from guilt and deep despair return unto the house of God. Come home. For love awaits you here. Good news, it's time to celebrate with friends who gather round. So God rejoices, Jesus said, whene'er the lost is found. May we return home every day. Amen.
May the Lord bless you and keep you. May He make His face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May He turn His countenance upon you and give you the peace that passes all understanding. And may you find joy, courage, and hope in knowing that God delights in you and longs to bring you home. And the blessing of God, the lover, the beloved, and the love overflowing be with you and remain with you now and always. Amen. Amen.